Chers amis, je suis très heureux d'ouvrir la troisième soirée « Addressing the Nation », un formidable projet imaginé par le Centre culturel irlandais à Paris. Ce projet offre une tribune à 40 artistes d'exception et nous nous embarquons ce soir pour un voyage avec 10 d'entre eux. Ces 10 artistes nous font partager leurs réflexions sur des sujets aussi variés que la mondialisation, le changement climatique, le rôle de l'artiste dans la société, le processus créatif ou encore la perte et le chagrin. Leurs visions peuvent être légères ou sombres, osciller entre peur et espoir. Je suis particulièrement heureux de la participation ce soir de l'artiste franco-irlandaise Kelly Rivière, qui a conquis le public français avec sa pièce « An Irish Story », qu'elle pourra, j'espère, bientôt venir jouer en Irlande. Je me réjouis des liens étroits noués entre le Centre culturel irlandais, l'Alliance française de Dublin et l'ambassade de France en Irlande depuis de nombreuses années déjà, et je vous souhaite une soirée des plus stimulantes. I wanted to write a text that was so beautiful and so inspiring that everyone who heard it would levitate and beams of light would shoot out of their eyes and fingers like when the beast transforms back into a prince at the end of the fairy tale. Butterflies swarming out of armpits and rainbows and everyone would feel cleansed and rebalanced and ready to do things again. I wanted to conjure words that would split open our screens and build magic highways between here and there so we could all dance together, bumper to bumper in the in-between, snogging three at a time and flicking sweat across each other's faces. I wanted to write a path to guide, a spell to recover, a text that would raise the dead. But the words don't come. I spend my year reading tarot cards and star charts. The Hanging Man, the Twelfth House, wishes and disappointments. I realise during the second lockdown, as I make an arrangement to FaceTime my therapist, that what I really want isn't counselling, but fortune-telling. Someone to stare into the black mirror for me and read my future to sift the tea leaves and see adventures there on the high seas or tall dark strangers or a lady with a message riding on a dappled horse. Someone to say that as long as I take a herbal tea in the afternoon and sleep with a crystal under my pillow, then everything is going to be all right. Things will begin again. The wheel will turn. But those words don't come, those comforts. Something happens. But the signs are cloudy. We are in the middle of things, still. Transforming despite ourselves. Noticing the seasons change growing fatter. In September, a ladybird lands on my desk. In July, moths come in the night with wings that thump against the glass. In December, we walk in the snow at Letna and sit side by side under the metronome. In October, we pick mushrooms and eat them in a sauce. We talk and listen, a day and a night through. And some old mess fixes itself, or a knot unwinds inside. And there's a fresh feeling between us in the morning. And that was something I hadn't asked for.
There's graffiti etched deep underground on the wall of a Hong Kong subway station. It translates as, we can't return to normal because the normal we had was precisely the problem. Across the globe in Santiago, Chile, activists project their mantra onto the side of a skyscraper. It reads, we won't return to normality because normality was the problem. Closer to home in Amsterdam, hastily pasted posters line the iconic canals. The bold black text screams, we can't go back to normal because normal was exactly the problem. Three disparate cities with their own distinct cultures sharing one message. Things need to change. Before we rush to delete 2020 from memory, to erase the year of illness, lockdowns, isolation and despair, let's instead seize the opportunity to learn from the pandemic, to learn from this global disruption, to reflect on and take stock of the world we've created for ourselves and each other. One thing is certain, Things need to change. The old systems are broken. There's no going back. 2021 offers a year of unprecedented hope. The hope is that we don't go back to normal. The hope is that we use this pause as a catalyst for change. To recognise the injustices in our society and tackle them head on. To keep pushing for social equity, fairness and equality to even out the playing field for all citizens. Hope for the most meaningful coming together of our lifetime. Coming together to talk to each other, care for each other, to build community and use our communal force for good. 2021 offers a hope of healing. It offers hope of a cultural, social and societal renaissance. It offers hope of a fresh start. But it's up to us to make sure hope happens. There's graffiti scrawled in neon on a laneway in Dublin city centre. Quoting Heraclitus, it reads, change is the only constant in life. Things need to change. That's certain. And that change starts with us. So let us change. Constantly. Defiantly. And fabulously. Together. These are unusual times. I think it is safe to say that the impact of COVID-19 globally has highlighted the fragility and vulnerability of globalization as a sustainable model at numerous levels. The issue around PPE clothing throughout the pandemic highlighted the fragility of supply lines and shone a light on the necessity to have the ability to manufacture and produce goods at a local level for a sustainable future. Surely it is time to reassess globalisation as a viable model moving forward. COVID has also highlighted the ability for our ecosystems to rebound when given an opportunity. Personally, I believe that the environmental, political and economic implications of climate collapse are the most important issues we are facing today. These are complex issues and must be treated as such. As we slowly move out of this pandemic, the experience of sitting in front of each other, engaging in conversation and physically participating in creative output will be more important than ever. 
Scientific data points to the overwhelming need for all of us to engage collectively to ensure a positive outcome for future generations. Evolutionary thinking informs us that humans intrinsically function best as small, highly cooperative social groups. Cooperation at this scale highlights our capacity to change. We must urgently engage in cooperative actions at various scales, in essence to highlight the power of one to have a positive impact and to ensure a sustainable future. In 2020, our calendars and diaries became blacked out spaces full of cancellations, interruptions and absences. Because of these voids, I've thought a great deal about time and creativity and how we are invited or permitted as artists to show our work to the world and how this public exposure leads to creative breakthroughs. I'll start with a short quote. Through all the world, there goes one long cry from the heart of the artist. Give me leave to do my utmost. This is a line at the end of the film, The Bet's Feast, written by Karen Blixen. The late great Janet Mullarney uses it to thank the team at the High Lanes Gallery for enabling a powerful exhibition there in 2015. It feels miraculous now to have spent early 2020 in residence at the Irish Cultural Centre in Paris. This was a period of intense creativity for me, the first time I had an extended work phase without children for 12 years. It was fascinating to grasp how differently I, am, I functioned with unrationed studio time. I realised what all artist parents intrinsically know, how productive we can be, even within a constrained time frame. But what was transformative in Paris was a kind of expanded mental space. I had time to develop multiple new ideas, some to work on straight away and others preserved for the future. I then spent lockdown in Belfast with my husband and my three children and during that time my working hours were restricted. My art making was slotted in between homeschooling, household schedules and juggling of tasks. I thought often of the artist Villa de Barlow who brought up five children with her husband. She talks of being unable to work productively for any longer than four hours because this was the length of time that she and her husband swapped between them as they taught, looked after their family and made artwork. Decades later, in her 70s, she still works in four hourly blocks. The UK-based Freelance Foundation has recently published research showing how severely artist mothers found their work affected during lockdown. And I wonder how we can constructively work to fix institutionalised sexism in the commercial art world. Shining a sharp light on this helps, as the Waking the Feminist and the Me Too movements did. But often, after a period of focus and change, the numbers slip back. Female representation in London galleries has dropped in percentage numbers since 2017. I have taken inspiration this year from Black Lives Matter, as subject material of my work, but also as evidence of a wider movement for equality which foregrounds the structural reproduction of privilege and access to resources. The essential message of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020 has been to make us aware of persistent and lethal racism within our society and institutions. As an artist who researches and documents protest movements, I know it can take decades to affect actual change. I hope we now become more attuned to who is missing from shortlists and exhibition rosters. Counting is of course essential, but it's not enough. We need to address the conditions that limit the quantity and quality of work that gets an artist to the point where they are eligible to be counted.
During this strange time, all of our practices across disciplines have been hugely, hugely affected. I hope you, our audiences and my fellow artists have found ways to make things. Out of making comes thinking and in hard times it's easy to forget about this magical combination which enables hope and a vision for the future. I'd like to start by reading a verse from my poem, Keeping Vigil. It expresses an important theme of mine, the conjunction between joy in life, joy of lovers, and this cruelty and suffering, especially in war. It is not that the world is safer, wars ravage as usual, Children die unnoticed in our sleep along the same fragrant roads between the olive groves where we first embraced. Women are herded to slaughter. My journey as a writer might best be defined perhaps as a desire to explore otherness, the ways in which societies construct castes of insiders and excluded. I like to jolt readers from the safe seat of detachment, restoring so-called outsiders to the mainstream of human experience. In the early years of my life, each evening, my father, who died when I was seven, read to his three youngest children each evening the great classics of European literature. Dickens, Robert Louis Stevenson, Verne, Twain, the Brontes. These heroic books and characters inspired in me a passion for adventure and justice. I grew up in the 50s and 60s, an intensely conservative period in Irish history, a Catholic state for a Catholic people. At 18, I came to study in Paris, attracted already by literature engagé. Sartre, de Beauvoir, Camus, existentialists who revived the idea of the artist's commitment to social issues. Coming home at 23, I joined the women's movement and with a group of radical friends, formed the first sexual liberation movement, LGBT. And I began with others, the exhilarating, arduous journey of luring Ireland into the 20th century. Eventually, after much campaigning and travel, I gave in to the strongest impulse I've known. I ran away to write in a cottage in Kerry. When I first published, there was hardly one novel by an Irish woman in an Irish bookshop. Now it's impossible to count them. So many new voices, an orchestra of rich and varied themes. A revolution in social conditions has been accompanied by an artistic upheaval that inspires it and do documents it. In Ireland, we still fortunately seem to revere our poets and writers. Consider the outpouring of sorrow last year at the death of the poets, Evan Boland and Derek Mahan, both friends of mine many years ago. In this century, I hope women will at last draw parallel with men in public recognition. But can literature we have to ask ourselves, can it survive the ravages, the shrill voice of social media? 
perhaps stories and poetry are so deeply embedded in our DNA that readers will always crave them. I hope so. It's looking good so far with the extraordinary flourishing of literature and the, all the arts in Ireland, music, lit, oh, music and visual arts are extraordinary things happening there. If so, if, if we live and if literature lives with us and if we continue in peace times to create it, there might come a day when no one notices an author's gender or race, but says only, this morning, I started an astonishing novel by an extraordinary human. To be a writer is to believe in the transcendent power of story to reveal truth. Our task as artists then must be to listen, to reflect, and when that's done, to speak back to our culture, to enlarge understanding, to teach empathy, and to change our world. That was the most important thing to me, to change our world, apart from the great joy of writing, of giving expression to the imagination. I love it, and I love reading. I hope you do too. Two thousand and twenty was the year I stopped believing in empathy. As it became clear that though we were all negotiating the same choppy waters, we certainly weren't doing so in the same boat, I began wondering whether it was actually possible to put myself in another shoes. As a fiction writer, I've always assumed myself capable of empathy. What are characters if not proof that I can imagine the world through another's eyes? And as a long-term advocate for cross-community arts here in Belfast, I've placed a heavy emphasis on empathy. I've spent much of the last 20 years helping workshop participants explore perspectives different from their own. 2020 turned my thinking upside down. Each time I tried to empathise with what others were facing, I hit a solid brick wall. I could see everyone was having a difficult time, and everyone's difficult was slightly different. I could sympathise. I could, on those days when I didn't feel utterly depleted, listen or help in a practical way. What I couldn't do was empathise. I kept thinking, this is what I'd do in those circumstances. This is how I'd feel and react. I was incapable of getting over myself. I'm sure this problem isn't unique to me. When it comes to imagining something we haven't experienced, humans rely on the limited range of our own experiences to conjure up a composite notion of what the other's going through. We can only understand another's joy or sadness in relation to the various joys and sadnesses we've known. 2020 won't stop me trying to empathise. I believe that Northern Ireland, and indeed the world, would be a lot less troubled if more people strove to see the other's perspective. But empathy, much like infinity, is a concept which can never be fully achieved. We're far too bound to our own sense of self. Losing faith in empathy has actually given me a fresh respect for what others are going through. If I can't fully understand your experience, neither can I reduce it, quantify it or explain it away. I don't get to dismissively say, I understand what you're going through. Instead, if I'm lucky, I get to sit with you as we experience difficult in our different ways. This might not look like pure empathy, but it's a good starting point.
As a screenwriter and director, I'm compelled to use screenwriting tools to find structure and meaning in events. It's necessary both for my work and for trying to keep my own existential panic at bay. Well, now we've all found ourselves embroiled in the biggest drama of our times. The inciting incident, a global pandemic, has hurt each and every one of us off course, but it's also set us on a potential hero's journey if we choose to accept the call. In drama, we say that under pressure, true character is revealed. While we're all facing the same major conflict, our personal challenges and stories vary greatly. However, this pandemic has put us all under unique pressures and each individual's experience is valid. To various extents, we've all had to lay down many of the tools, crutches and masks we, we thought we could rely on to get us through life and to lend us our sense of ourselves, be it our careers, our activities, our relationships, even basic human contact. In this past while, we've had our worlds turned upside down and our sense of control of our lives shattered in a way that, quite frankly, people privileged enough to live in relative safety are not used to. In fact, we've all been forced to face up to both our personal and our global vulnerability. However, in drama, in life as in drama, there is the potential to find our true strength in this vulnerability and in our choices. We can either choose to shut down and entrench in fear, or we can allow it to open us up and to embrace uncertainty and to increase empathy for the challenges that other players face in their personal dramas and the decisions that they're impelled to make. And if under pressure we screw up in one scene and act less in heroically, there is always the hope for redemption in our next choice. If there's one thing that I hope for as we gradually emerge from this pandemic, it's that we continue to redefine what it is to be heroic and who and what should be celebrated. And that kindness and compassion will finally be valued above the accumulation of wealth and power and success for ego's sake. But of course, life isn't a film. And as much as I might wish it, I don't think we're going to get a neat and happy resolution anytime soon, if indeed ever. Instead, it might be more like a returning TV series. But unless we urgently address the climate crisis, there is increasing and escalating dramas on the horizon. However, we each have our part to play and the choices we make both individually and as an ensemble will literally determine the future of our planet. Three years ago, I wrote a play called An Irish Story. It's about my grandfather, Peter, who was born in the 30s in a small village in County Limerick, who came to England in the 50s and who disappeared in the 70s. We lost all trace of him. In the play, I recount the inquiries I made to try and find him, which I didn't. Spoiler. I wrote An Irish Story because in my family, Nobody talked about him anymore. It was taboo. He had left my grandmother and their six children behind him. So in the words of my grandmother, he was irresponsible. But I had always found very sad that a man who had generated so much life, who had several children, who in turn had their own children, was not mentioned anymore in the family. I was his granddaughter and I couldn't talk about him to anybody. And I thought this was sad. So in a way, I wrote this play to make him live again. And that's the power of theater. You create fiction and through fiction, you make dead people live again. As if by magic, the play was a great success. It was a sellout in Paris for seven months 
and it toured all around France. And after each performance, spectators came to see me to tell me their personal stories, which I found was deeply moving and which justified the purpose of my initiative. It's what we call catharsis in theatre. And I realised the power of storytelling. I've experienced this personally. I also realised in performing an Irish story that I thought a lot about disappearance, about loss, because it's the story of someone you lose and how you survive to this loss. When the COVID virus appeared in our lives, we were harshly confronted overnight with disappearance. We lost our jobs, especially as artists. We lost our freedom of movement, our guidelines, contact with loved ones, and we had mixed feelings, exhaustion, incomprehension, but also moments of bliss. I personally, I mean, I've loved spending so much time with my children and my partner, especially during the first lockdown. However, it remained a shock, one that has completely changed our lives, probably for decades to come. And I realized through my play that one can transform a shock, a trauma, into something positive. So I like to think that although it's very hard to get through this health crisis because we, get to, we have to think a lot about the meaning of life and death, I want to believe that something good will come of this experience. Perhaps through the act of creation, whatever creation you choose, I hope we do not lose our need to tell stories and to listen to them. Stories about grief, but also about how one can overcome grief because it's vital. In this time, I became an apprentice to withdrawal, no longer being involved in plans as I had them. An apprentice to taking things away, offers no longer available. Withdrawal from the future as I imagined it, experiencing then the physical and mental effects when a person stops an addictive behaviour, all withdrawn. The couple as I knew it, the city as I lived it, liveness as I directed it. Withdrawing into aloneness, learning aloneness. Withdrawing further, moving in and eventually out of an occupied area. Unmarrying a city, a husband, I ferried home. Withdrawal tutored me home. Back to the source, the origins of my aptitude for withdrawal. My apprenticeship directed me here to the withdrawal of a father's love, early, too close to the beginning. And I sat, for weeks I sat, angry at his grave, mad at his graving, I now in need of daughtering, why this forsaking, withdrawing then that question, where is your love, father, I engraved, how to daughter without, I asked, squatted out the silence till understanding advanced, Exhume what was withdrawn, he fathered. Love, daughter, do not withdraw your love. I switched subjects then. 
Withdrawal will not master me. I will not master withdrawal. Now, this time, I will be an apprentice again to love. Kieran and Boss and Glauen Gach Blien ist Hogan Krach, O Hum and Egg Matel to Koren von Salon, Sir. Is Dirian Mare is Bull and Boyle is Hogan Lesh Og Ishan. I want to join you in the hope of spring, in the joy of summer knowing that those times will come. But it is winter still, and we cannot rush our seasons. We cannot and we should not try to escape the loss that we have suffered, nor the grief that many of us feel and are still trying to understand. Grief stills despite talk of predictable stages to be moved through, in reality, grief is untamed and careless of schedules. It does its own bidding. It will not be rushed away. It unravels us and our plans. It undoes the false hope that things that we will not come to an end. And when we try to ignore this, to get grief over with, we lose an opportunity to live together more wisely. Because though it feels so lonely and isolating, in grief our relation to uh, our fundamental connection to others is painfully felt. Grief confirms our vulnerability to others, and in this way, if attended to, it inspires action. It mobilises us to cherish what and who matters beyond the surface of dispensable achievements and distractingly relentless activity. We are not vulnerable in the same way. Our lives are made precarious to different extents, even at the best of times, but we are all vulnerable to mortality and it is better to understand that shared condition. Grief stills, but while we're alive, that stillness is a pause. Our experience of loss has shown us that we can learn from a pause, that pausing, that changing the rhythm is part of the choreography of a wiser life that is more hospitable to the needs and flourishing of more people. It shows us that the pressures of relentless mobility, of relentless activity, are not sustainable. So to oppose that motion, to oppose that particular choreography, is not to oppose motion itself. But it is a demand for us to deploy a greater choreographic sensitivity, to vary the score, to vary the tempo, the location of the dance, so that more of us can do it together. I'm asking us to use our grief to dance more wisely. Shinian Krach, a hogan and boss lesh, and Knagaris Santoch, O Horus Godorus.
Ni heshkoch tenye, nil tigno Seralik pastor dashke gingaler.